Welcome to the philosophy of today. I'm Jim Hammond. We mentioned in the last show that the philosophy of today says that everything is connected and everything is alive. We mentioned that the philosophy of today can be called hermetic, mystical, non-rational, occult, Jungian, or the perennial philosophy. According to the philosophy of today, the world is interconnected and communication is possible between distant particles or distant people. Um, the behavior of particles is strikingly similar to the behavior of living organisms, including people. So the old uh, alchemical tradition said that um, the world is one, unus mundus, one world. Uh, we don't split the world into living things and dead things. We don't split the world into matter and organisms. Uh, the whole world is one, unus mundus. Um, so the quantum physics, which talks about the communication between particles, it hasn't really changed our worldview. It simply confirms what we've known all along, in a sense. The hermetic philosophy says, as above, so below. That's the slogan of the hermetic philosophy, as above, so below. So the hermetics depict a magician pointing with his right hand up and his left arm pointing down. So that's how they suggest that as above, so below. What they mean is that uh, heavenly things like stars and planets follow the same um, laws as earthly things like people and living organisms. So they see the same behavior uh, above and below in different spheres of being, so to speak. Um, they were very interested in astrology. So we say the same thing uh, today in the philosophy of today, as above, so below, except instead of talking about stars and planets, we talk about particles. So instead of saying that the earthly things are similar to stars and planets, we're saying that the earthly things, like human beings, behave in a way that's similar to particles. So if we say as above, so below, we're referring to human beings as the above and particles as the below. But it's the same idea that the microcosm and the macrocosm are on the same page, so to speak, there in the same boat. It's one world. Uh, everything follows the same patterns and behavior. So what does the word hermetic mean? It comes from Hermes, the Greek god. Um, Hermes Trismegistus was a legendary Egyptian writer. And according to legend, he was older than the Old Testament. He was older than Socrates. He was uh, an Egyptian writer from the very earliest period. And part of the reason that people in Europe respected Hermes is that they thought he was the first. He was the primordial. He was the most ancient. Later on, people realized that he was not that ancient, that he was a fictitious being, a legendary person, and that it was really Gnostic writers from around two or 300 AD who had written the books attributed to Hermes. So Hermes Trismegistus is uh, attributed, uh, let's say, 10 books are attributed to Hermes. And um, you might speak of the body of literature, the hermetic body of literature. It came to Italy around 1453 because the Byzantine scholars in Constantinople who used Greek, uh, they came to Italy uh, because the Muslims had taken over Constantinople in 1453. So just as we said earlier that Zen came to the West in 1893, we could say that the Hermetic philosophy came to Western Europe in 1453. Uh, and it took Italy by storm. The Italians thought that this was the deepest wisdom, the most ancient wisdom. Uh, somebody who was working on a translation of Plato was told to stop translating Plato translate these hermetic books first, because they're the most important. So the hermetic books had an enormous impact on, on Italy. Perhaps the chief philosophical hermetist was Giordano Bruno, uh, and the chief um, imaginative hermetist, in other words, the, the imaginative writer who expressed the hermetic philosophy best was, in my view, Shakespeare.
and Shakespeare is from the same period of time as Bruno. They were contemporaries. The chief scholar of Bruno and Hermetism is an English woman, Frances Yates, who wrote a series of books about the Hermetic philosophy and Bruno and uh, all those subjects. So the philosophy of today says that communication is possible between things that were once close together, such as paired particles or twins or mother and child, um, people who are attached to each other. It could be the positive attachment of love. It could be the negative attachment of animosity. But any kind of attachment uh, creates the possibility for telepathic communication. A psychotherapist often has this kind of communication with his patient. Uh, Jung had a, a, a bond with a patient who was depressed and suicidal. And when the patient shot himself, Jung could feel the pain in, his, in the back of his own head at the spot where, where the patient was shot. So that's an example of a telepathic bond between a therapist and a patient. But therapists like Jung and Freud were very familiar with this close attachment that was created between therapist and patient. They talk about it a lot. I think transference is the term that Freud uses. And he felt it was the most important part of the process of therapy. We mentioned before that for the people that discovered quantum physics, like Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberg, they were baffled by the um, things that they were discovering in quantum physics. It just made no sense to them at all. But people who are used to the humanities, they see these communications um, frequently. So they see them in the literary world, and um, it doesn't surprise them as much. Um, for example, there's a new documentary about J.D. Salinger, and uh, he talks about having a telepathic bond with his first wife. He wrote a book about this relationship, and uh, like a lot of his books, it wasn't published in his lifetime, but apparently it's going to be published in the next five years. So Salinger talks about the telepathic bond with his first wife, and he also talks in The Catcher in the Rye about a communication between Holden Caulf Caulfield, his teenage protagonist, and Holden's w mother. Um, Holden is alone in a hotel in New York City. And he says he thought of uh, calling his uh, sister, Phoebe, on the phone. He wanted to talk to Phoebe. He's feeling lonely. Um, and then he says, quote, I thought of maybe hanging up if my parents answered, but that wouldn't have worked either. They'd know it was me. My mother always knows it's me. She's psychic. So Salinger is tuned into occult phenomena like a lot of writers are. Uh, these things are all around us. Um, it's a little hard for me to see how people can deny the reality of the occult because it seems to me that this sort of thing is all around us. It's an everyday, um, everyday thing. And a lot of writers like Salinger, they're aware of these things and they write about them. So I would say even if you're not interested in the occult or don't believe it exists at all, it would still make sense to learn a little about it because it's such a common thing in novels and um, movies and stuff like that. Uh, here's another quote from The Catcher in the Rye. Um, Holden Caulfield is talking about his brother, Ali, and he says, I started playing golf when I was only 10 years old. I remember once the summer I was around 12, teeing off and all and having a hunch that if I turned around all of a sudden, I'd see Allie. So I did, and sure enough, he was sitting on his bike outside the fence. So notice how he uses the word hunch. Um, he's got this inexplicable hunch. Uh, he's got some sort of telepathic bond with Allie. When Allie's looking at him, he can feel that Allie's looking at him and feel that Allie's there. So he turns around, and sure enough, Allie's there. But I wouldn't even say that Salinger has a special interest in the occult. I would just say that he has an average interest. Um, so many imaginative writers, so many uh, famous novelists, Tolstoy, Dickens, Ibsen, etc., they're all interested in these kinds of everyday occult phenomena. Um,
One writer that had a special interest in the occult was Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, he wrote a story called The Man with the Twisted Lip, and he describes a husband who's missing. So Sherlock Holmes tells the distraught wife that her husband may have been murdered, but the wife says, I know that all is well with him. There is so keen a sympathy between us that I should know if evil came upon him. So here's a wife who has a telepathic bond with her husband, and she knows that if anything happens to the husband, if he's killed, for example, she'll sense it, she'll know it. Um, and therefore, at this point, she knows that he's still alive. And Doyle also wrote a story called The Adventure of the Speckled Band, in which he talks about a telepathic link between twins. He says, quote, I could not sleep that night. A vague feeling of impending misfortune impressed me. My sister and I, you will recollect, were twins, and you know how subtle are the links which bind two souls which are so closely allied. Um, so Doyle was very interested in the occult, and he gave talks about it. Uh, he, he spoke in the United States and England, um, a lot of public lectures on the subject. He also wrote a story called Silver Blaze, where he talks about the way that a horse has a sixth sense, and the, the horse can tell uh, that somebody is, is going to try to injure him. So um, Doyle says, quote, with the strange instinct of animals feeling that some mischief was intended, the horse had lashed out and the steel shoe had struck Straker full on the forehead. So I would say that anybody that owns a dog or a cat knows that animals can sense things uh, without language. They can tell um, through their telepathy or through their intuition, um, they can sense what's happening. Uh, so people that own dogs and cats can, can often tell this kind of a story. Um, and even animals that are not mammals. For example, there's a documentary called Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. Um, and it's about a, a, a man that tries to take care of parrots and he forms a close bond with parrots. And um, it's like a telepathic bond, which he, he feels is particularly close when the parrots are dying. And um, there's a cat in Providence called Oscar the Cat, who lives at a nursing home called Steer House. And he's able to sense when a person is dying, and he goes to their bed. and. Um, there's been um, articles written about Oscar the Cat, and uh, so he has some sort of um, uh, telepathic instinct or um, some sort of sixth sense. I mentioned before that the writer who's best at describing the um, hermetic world is uh, Shakespeare. And um, Shakespeare in Macbeth, for example, he shows the weather in sync with what's happening in the political situation. So at the same time that there's a revolution in the political scene, there's a very fierce storm outside. Um, so this is a kind of synchronicity between nature and man, between the weather and the political situation. So Shakespeare is full of these synchronicities. Um, if there's a revolution in the political situation, as you find in Macbeth and Julius Caesar, you also have animals behaving strangely. You have various comets and meteors showing that the whole uh, universe is in sync. The whole universe is, is upset and disturbed uh, when you have these political revolutions. So it's a synchronistic world that he portrays. He portrays the atmosphere um, and all these different elements in the atmosphere, like the animal behavior, the human behavior, the behavior of comets and meteors and stuff, all those different kinds of behavior are in harmony, in sync with each other. So this is what Jung called synchronicity. Um,
it seems to me there's a deep uh, parallel between Shakespeare and Jung. Um, but the literary critic, the Shakespeare critic, who brought out this side of um, Shakespeare best is a critic named G. Wilson Knight. Um, he focuses on what I would call the hermetic Shakespeare. Um, Knight was a student of the occult. He was interested in the occult. He was friends with a young writer named Colin Wilson um, who has written about the occult. Uh, Wilson Knight brings out a different side of Shakespeare that's often overlooked, the side that is what you might call the hermetic Shakespeare, similar to uh, Giordano Bruno, the Italian philosopher. So I would say there are certain periods of history where um, you find the hermetic philosophy is dominant, such as the Italian Renaissance. And then there's other periods when a more rational philosophy is dominant, such as around 1650 with Isaac Newton's um, mechanical worldview. Uh, that became a very popular worldview at that time. Um, and then the hermetic worldview went underground, so to speak. So you have things like um, the Rosicrucian um, school or the Freemasons. They start just when um, people like uh, Descartes are getting started. So around 1600, um, the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons get started, and um, they're sort of an underground version of the hermetic philosophy that was popular during the Renaissance. So they, um, they're they sort of frowned on by the establishment. The church is uncomfortable with uh, the hermetic philosophy. The Catholic Church um, and also the Protestant churches, um, they're not comfortable with the hermetic philosophy. Bruno was burned at the stake by the Catholic Church. Pico della Mirandola, another hermetic philosopher, he was uh, imprisoned, I believe, by the uh, church. So a lot of these um, hermetic thinkers uh, get into trouble with the establishment. The hermetic philosophy is kind of a new religion in a sense. Uh, I would say the philosophy of today is, is sort of a new religion. So. Um, that's why the established religion, whether Protestant or Catholic, is uncomfortable with this uh, school of thought because it's, um, it's a challenge to them. It, it doesn't quite follow the rules that they want to follow. It's a very broad uh, philosophy. It, it embraces different creeds. It looks at the um, Kabbalah, for example, which is Jewish m mysticism. And um, it looks at all sorts of mysticism it tries to make a big tent, so to speak, and bring everybody in. Um, and therefore, it, it arouses the um, animosity of the established church in many cases. Another writer besides Shakespeare who talks about what I would call the hermetic philosophy is Edgar Allan Poe. He wrote a story called The Fall of the House of Usher. And in that story, <clears throat> he depicts a man Roderick Usher, who dies at the same time that his house falls down. So the house and the person have some sort of rapport, some sort of um, synchronicity, let's say. Um, this is a little harder for people to grasp than the bond or uh, telepathic link between, let's say, a mother and child or twins. Um, the link between a house and a person is a little harder to grasp, but I think it's essentially the same thing. It's a, uh, a telepathic bond. So you might say that people like Poe and Shakespeare are putting this material in their work just to liven up their work, just as a literary device. You might say that they don't really believe in it. I would say just the opposite. I would think they do believe in it, and they're trying to downplay it in order not to make their work very philosophical. Um, Poe was a deep thinker. He was an aspiring philosopher. He wrote a book called Eureka, which he believed unlocked the secret of the universe. So he was uh, an ambitious philosophical thinker, but I think he tries to downplay that in his imaginative works because he doesn't want to weigh them down, so to speak, with a lot of philosophizing.
but he does mention a couple of thinkers at the start of the fall of the House of Usher. He mentions Campanella and Swedenborg. These are big names in the Hermetic tradition. These are part of the, um, the same tradition as Bruno and the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons. So Poe was alive to that tradition. He was receptive to that tradition. You might say Poe was a hermetic thinker. He's part of the romantic movement um, like Coleridge and Keats and uh, others. And this, her, this romantic movement is very sympathetic toward the hermetic tradition, the Rosicrucian tradition, the Freemason tradition. Uh, you might say the romantic movement is a rebellion against the Newtonian movement. It's a rebellion against the mechanical worldview that Isaac Newton uh, believed in. So you can go through history and you can find the Hermetic tradition um, having ups and downs. Um, for example, in the time of Plato and Socrates, the Hermetic tradition was taking a back seat to a more rational worldview. Um, but then later in antiquity, you have sort of a rebellion against the rational school, and you have a sort of a revival of um, a hermetic kind of thinking. The ancient Greeks and Romans talked about what they called the sympathy of all things, meaning that everything in the universe was in sync or in sympathy with everything else. So I think there's a lot of hermetic thinking in antiquity, in the Greek and Roman tradition. The Greeks and Romans are not all uh, mechanical, rational, scientific thinkers. There was a atom, uh, atomism with people like Democritus, and this um, atomistic tradition is sort of like the Newtonian school. It breaks things into pieces. It's a very rational worldview. But that's not all that antiquity has to offer. A lot of Greek and Roman thinking is what you might call hermetic. Um, as I said before, they believed in the sympathy of all things. One of the themes that Edgar Allan Poe has in his work is that there's no clear line between living and, and dying. He often depicts dead people who come to life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, you might say the hermetic philosophy blurs the distinction between life and death. It says everything is alive in a sense. It also blurs the distinction between matter and living things, um, between dead matter and organic uh, life. Um, in a sense, the, the hermetic philosophy sees one world. It sees dead and living on the same page in the same category, so to speak. Uh, it sees matter and life um, on the same page and in the same category. You might ask, where do living things come from? If living things come from lower forms of life, and if you trace back all the different uh, kinds of life, if you trace them all back to the first living cell, the first spark of life, you can ask, where did that first spark come from? The first spark of life probably came from inorganic matter, in other words, dead matter, um, chemicals. Um, so therefore, you could say that our ancestors are particles and, and material things. So maybe it's not surprising that living things behave in a way that reminds us of the way particles behave, because we're all related in a sense. By the way, uh, if you want to give any feedback on the show, we have an email address, which is today at ljhammond.com. And there's a website, ljhammond.com slash today. If you go to that website, you'll get more information about the people that we're discussing. So that's all for today, and thank you for watching.